For millennia, men have found darkened corners, quiet rooms, locked doors, and gathered. There, it is said they conduct strange rites, act out medieval rituals, and try to remake the world in their own image. Activities shrouded in mystery, membership unknown, the marks of the secret societies. Secret organizations may loom largest in the public mind, the Freemasons or Masons, the world's oldest and largest secret society, and Yale University's Skull and Bones, one of the world's smallest and most exclusive secret societies. Why do some say that their members will defend their brethren or protect the group's secrets at any cost? This former Mason says death threats have followed him ever since he started revealing the secret rituals of the Masons. This publisher says he was contacted by Skull and Bones member and former president George Bush when he tried to expose the secrets of that group. A one-time high-ranking detective in London charges the Masons with destroying his career when he tried to uncover an alleged Masonic conspiracy. The bonds formed among members flow from their hidden rituals. But how these ancient and mysterious ceremonies work their magic remains unexplained. In every country, Freemasonry has its unique character and its unique enemies. In the United States, the most caustic foes of the organization are conservative Christians. More than two dozen Protestant denominations have joined the Catholic Church in opposing Freemasonry. They see exotic rituals drenched in religious symbolism, bloody oaths exhumed from the Middle Ages, and an aura of mystery, and find the horns of Satan in the compass and square. In his early 20s, Jack Harris joined a Bible study class at a Baptist church outside Baltimore. Several of his classmates were Masons. My friends in the uh, Bible class told me that the Masons was mysterious, that you will learn things about God that you will never learn in a church. I liked the men that I was involved with in Freemasonry very much. Stuck together, they backed each other up. The fact it was an all men's organization, I kind of liked that. Harris quickly advanced through the levels of Freemasonry. Within just seven years, his lodge installed him as its leader, the Worshipful Master. I had a definite, heartfelt interest in what they believed in. I had an interest in the ritual. I loved the whole association with the organization and what they taught. In 1970, after nine years in Freemasonry, Harris became a born-again Christian after watching a Billy Graham crusade on television. He began objecting to the rule that Masonic ritual cannot mention Jesus Christ because no aspect of Masonry can favor one religion. Harris found that philosophy incompatible with his version of Christianity. He quit the Brotherhood. He believes now that Freemasonry is satanic. He cites the ritual for one ceremony, which uses a human skull resting on a Bible, burning candles, and a sword aimed at the throat of a kneeling man, identical, he says, to the altars used by worshipers of the devil. They teach you different principles of how to get to heaven, how to good, live a good life, apart from Jesus Christ, contrary to the word of God, which means they're giving you a lie. Satan is the father of those lies. Harris's conclusion is the same as one of Freemasonry's most outspoken and influential opponents. A physician and author from Beaumont, Texas, Dr. Larry Holly has led the anti-Masonic fight before the Southern Baptist Convention, the largest Protestant denomination in the U.S. I believe that the system of Freemasonry, the dynamic of Freemasonry, the spirit that empowers Freemasonry is Luciferian, is satanic. Freemasonry treats Jesus Christ as a good man or a great leader or a, as a great prophet, but ignores the reality in my mind that he is in fact the only begotten son of, of God and the only way to save for men. Jack Harris believes the Masons have turned their satanic fury on him. After Harris left the organization in 1972, Local ministers asked him to tell their congregations about the so-called evils of Masonry. 
he began to dramatize Masonic ceremonies, depicting the actual secret rituals. Behind me, to the left, is where the Worshipful Master sits. I am the Worshipful Master of the Lodge, and over his head is a symbol, the letter G. And here we have the three lesser lights of Freemasonry. Fourteen years after leaving the Masons, Harris appeared on national television, revealing the secrets of Masonry to the country. Then he says the serious threats began. Harris heard one of the most harrowing from a minister in the Philadelphia area. Reverend James Flanagan had signed an affidavit attesting that he had been told that four citizens of the state of New Jersey, later identified according to Harris as state troopers, had said they wanted travel to the state of Maryland for the purpose of murdering Jack Harris. They promised to kill my wife, my children, and my, you know, my person, me, for revealing those secrets. Harris called the Baltimore County Police. My house was under 24-hour surveillance for one entire year as a result of these threats. Based on the threats, Harris got a permit to carry a gun. He swears that the violent penalties Masonic ritual demands of its members for exposing secrets are not symbolic, as the Masons insist, but real. If anybody would have disobeyed the obligation or would have betrayed masonry, I would have got some officers together of like mind, and we would have eliminated them. We would have murdered them. I took it seriously. I was never told in masonry that the oath is symbolic. Did a conspiracy forged in the bloody oaths of Masonic initiation plot to kill Jack Harris? Every time he reveals Masonic ritual, is he risking his life? The actual 1986 complaint to the Baltimore County Police Department describes the police version of the case. The spokesman for the department explains the police response. Mr. Harris's house was not under 24-hour surveillance for a year or for any period of time at all. We got a complaint in 1986 that Mr. Harris had received third-hand a threat against his life. He supposedly exposed some rituals of a group that he belonged to. What our intelligence section did, they did some preliminary inquiries into uh, what this group was about and if there were any uh, historical actions taken against former members. They found nothing that would indicate that Mr. Harris would need 24-hour police protection from this agency. What Harris got, Novak says, is known as selective enforcement, an hourly drive-by from an officer in a squad car. He says that kind of surveillance usually lasts up to several weeks, not a year. Harris considered the threat deadly serious. His local police force apparently did not. After receiving the affidavit from the Philadelphia minister, Harris says he heard nothing more about the threat. Masons reject out of hand Harris's contention that Freemasonry's rituals lead to death threats. Masons say the infamous penalties for exposing Masonic secrets remain part of the American ritual because the members love tradition. Freemasons in England have removed the penalties. George Peter, a Mason for 48 years and the head historian for the Masons of the state of New York, says the penalties are strictly symbolic. No Mason, he says, ever is expected to injure or murder another Mason. People need to know that you are not binding any individual to have that happen, and it does not happen and never has happened. The penalties, according to Freemasons, exist instead to remind members that a man's life contains sacred commitments to family, country, and religion that he should be willing to die for. The penalties supposedly protect secrets, but Masons downgrade the importance of those secrets. They say the secrets exist only so one Mason can identify another. If we have a member that uh, goes and uh, gives all the secrets of Freemasonry, nothing should happen to that person. Death threats do not square with the principles of Freemasonry uh, in no way, shape, nor manner. It's just uh, foreign to the concepts of Freemasonry. According to Masons, so is Satanism. They point to the G in the American Masonic symbol. It stands for God. Gary Leeser holds a doctorate in the philosophy of religion and identifies himself as a conservative born-again Christian. 
the ordained minister directed the 1993 investigation of Freemasonry for the Southern Baptist Church. Dr. Leeser is now Mason. I have studied Freemasonry almost full time for four years. I have read both Masonic books and books by Masonic critics, and I have examined them carefully, and I have yet to find anything in Freemasonry that I would consider to be satanic. Masonic critics believe there are only two possible understandings of God and the world. One is God's side, and the other was everybody else or Satan's side. Did the hand of Masonry try to kill Jack Harris? Without any real proof, all that remains for some is a fear of the secret society. Historians say Freemasonry, founded in 1717, has influenced virtually every fraternal order and collegiate fraternity. Wherever men meet and adopt secret rituals, they share the legacy of the Freemasons. Nearly six million members of all races and religions, all men, and all believers in a supreme being meet in nearly windowless lodges throughout the world. There, facing a central altar, their chief officer sitting in the east, they perform intricate dramas, usually based on stories from the Old Testament. The ritualistic plays are the initiation ceremonies for each new member and the core of the Masonic rites. The rites, according to the Masons, teach the value of honor and love, or the struggle between insight and ignorance, and the importance of trustworthiness and keeping confidences. Those values helped to convince 13 signers of the U.S. Constitution, including Ben Franklin and George Washington, to wear the Masonic apron. Fifteen presidents also were drawn to the rites of Freemasonry, including Harry Truman and Gerald Ford. Composers Irving Berlin, Mozart, and Duke Ellington were Masons, joining Will Rogers, Charles Lindbergh, and John Wayne. The rites changed for each new lesson, called a degree. The essence of Freemasonry resides in its third degree. In that lesson, the initiate learns Freemasonry's essential symbolism and its most protected word as he reaches one of the pinnacles of the organization, the Master Mason Degree. This reenactment conducted by Jack Harris reveals crucial elements of the ritual for the Master Mason Degree. It begins as the worshipful master, the head of the lodge, tells the candidate he must pass one more test before becoming a Master Mason. You have a rough and dangerous road to travel as a test of your fidelity in keeping secret all that has been communicated to you. In your travels, you will be beset by ruffians, perhaps murdered, an instance has been known. The blindfolded candidate, accompanied by his guide, plays the role of Hiram Abiff in Masonic lore, the master mason in charge of building the Temple of Solomon in ancient Israel. During the ritual, a temple workman attacks him. Grand Master Hiram Abiff, I am glad to meet you thus alone. You have long promised us the secrets of a master mason. Behold, the temple is almost completed, and we have yet to receive them. Give me the secrets of a master mason. This is a very unusual way and manner of asking, nor is it the time and place. Wait until the temple is completed, and if found worthy, you shall receive them. This is neither satisfactory. Give me the secrets of a master mason, or I shall take your life. I cannot, neither can they be given, but in the presence of three, Solomon, king of Israel, Hiram, king of Tyre, and myself. Give me the secrets of a master mason, or I shall take your life upon this spot. My life, but not the secrets. And die. Two more attackers confront the candidate as Hiram Abiff, before he is symbolically killed. Then die! Then, the worshipful master raises him from the dead, and finally accepts him into the arms of Freemasonry. I will now take the body by the strong grip of a master mason, or the lion's paw, and raise it upon the five points of fellowship. Maul Hall Bone. Brother Smith, you have been raised to the sublime degree of Master Mason, and the word which I have just communicated is a grand Masonic word, which you promised in your obligation never to reveal except in a way and manner in which you shall receive it, and then only in a low breath. 
You have been raised upon the five points of fellowship, which are, follow me, foot to foot, knee to knee, breast to breast, and hand to back and cheek to cheek or mouth to ear. Give me the word. Mama. The secret word, a part of every degree, is coupled with an oath sworn over a Bible, promising to defend fellow Masons and prescribing a blood-curdling penalty for any member who exposes the secrets or violates the oath of mutual defense. Binding myself under the no less penalty. Binding myself under the no less penalty. Than that of having my body severed in twain. Than that of having my body severed in twain. My bowels taken thence and my body burned to ashes. My bowels taken thence and my body burned to ashes. And those ashes scattered to the four winds of heaven. And those ashes scattered to the four winds of heaven. Brutal medieval penalties. Critics say they are as much a part of Freemasonry as the more than $1 million a day American Masons say they donate to charity. To their enemies, Freemasonry embraces a menacing mix of images and symbolism, forming a huge and sometimes to them a malevolent secret society. The mysterious rituals carried out behind the closed doors of the Masonic temples are said by some to nurture the seeds of conspiracy. London, the birthplace of Freemasonry, where the bonds among the brethren remain strong, perhaps some say too strong. In autumn 1981, Detective Chief Inspector Brian Willard took a new position with Scotland Yard. After nearly three decades on London's police force and seven commendations, Willard won an assignment to the elite public sector corruption unit, the Fraud Department, investigating some of England's most politically sensitive cases. Willard's commander had assigned him to investigate a group of local government bureaucrats in Islington, a borough of London. They supposedly had overpaid a construction firm by the equivalent of nearly $200,000 in a complicated kickback scheme. Soon, Willard noticed something strange in the behavior of his suspects. It seemed that there was a, a network working behind the scenes which was ensuring that information about, uh, information about facts that we needed to know was not going to come out. Willard had been told that several of the men suspected of fraud were Freemasons. I was aware uh, that Freemasonry had very binding oaths of loyalty one to another and that when people are in distress, their brothers come to their assistance. And this is a case which was tailor-made for that. Willard heard a borough insider was boasting that the investigation would go nowhere because the suspects belonged to the same Masonic Lodge as police officers in Willard's own fraud department. Journalist Martin Short the author of a best-selling book about the purported evils of British Freemasonry says Masonic connections between cops and criminals were well known to the London police. It became very clear in the 1970s when there were, uh, there were joint issues where Freemasons in the police and Freemasons, for instance, in the pornography trade were in the same lodges that criminal offenders were given uh, a license to traffic without fear of prosecution. Brian Willard was aware of this history of corruption. The investigation reached a crisis after he interviewed one of the suspects, telling him not to discuss the conversation with anyone. But immediately after Willard left, he allegedly was seen rushing to the office of another key suspect at the town hall. That night, according to Willard, that suspect locked his filing cabinet, something he almost never did, and left for an unannounced month-long vacation. The next day, Willard's secretary took an extraordinary phone call from one of London's top prosecutors, the one who decided which cases would go to trial. He wanted to find out the progress of the Islington investigation. London prosecutors, according to Willard, never ask for progress reports over the phone. He now feared this prosecutor, too, was a Freemason, 
and might have been trying to affect the case. Willard then realized he had to interview him. Aware that most of Scotland Yard's chiefs appeared to be Masons, he assumed they would deny his request. This forced him to make the biggest decision of his life. Instead of asking his superiors, he would ignore the chain of command and confront the prosecutor. Willard needed to find out what or who had prompted the prosecutor's call. Willard says the prosecutor told him he couldn't remember why he had called Willard. By the end of that day, Willard's commander had stripped him of all his duties. After 22 years as a highly decorated detective, he landed in uniform at a desk job in the outlying station house at Wembley. Another detective, reportedly a Mason, took over the Islington Town Council investigation. Weeks later, the case was dropped. I expected somebody to listen to why I'd done it and appreciate it. But of course, there again, the issue of Freemasonry comes in, and that existed at the highest level of the police force at that time. And of course, I wasn't aware of that. Willard reported to his new assignment and started a private lobbying campaign for an independent investigation into the reasons for his transfer. For the first time in his career, he received damning reviews written by his superiors at the station house, who he suspected were Masons. Willard refused to sign them. Nearly five years after leaving the fraud department, an anonymous ally mailed a package to Willard. It contained the secret membership list of this London Lodge that chronicled the names of nearly all of Willard's former superiors at Scotland Yard and the station house at Wembley. I'd been uh, looked at as somebody who was demented by the, the press and everybody else because I was saying this was happening to me, and nobody believed me. Well, I had proof. I had proof. I had hard evidence. In 1988, Willard, citing ill health, refused to return to work. After 33 years, he was dropped from the force and abandoned his campaign. His efforts, however, may have triggered a major policy change. In 1997, after a series of hearings, a committee in Britain's parliament made the unprecedented recommendation that Masonic police officers, judges, and prosecutors be required to make their membership public. Despite a lack of hard evidence, the committee concluded there was a public perception that Freemasons in the criminal justice system gave preferential treatment to fellow Masons. Was Brian Willard brought down by a Masonic conspiracy of police superiors, prosecutors, and corrupt officials? Are the bonds of Masonry so strong that they could compromise the sacred oath to uphold the law? Peter Burden, considered one of Great Britain's top crime reporters, was awarded the Order of the British Empire by Queen Elizabeth when he retired in 1996. He says Willard was transferred simply because he ignored the chain of command and even today has never proven any of his allegations of Masonic collusion. I monitored um, the case over many, uh, many years. Um, the problem with uh, Chief Inspector, ex-Chief Inspector uh, Willard's um, case um, was the lack of evidence. I certainly was unable to establish any evidence. I spoke to many police officers who were non-Masons who said, well, we appreciate it. Brian is convinced this is happening. But it's a terrible expression saying, at the end of the day, where's the evidence? I think in the Woolard case, it is quite difficult to actually prove uh, that, that, that Masons uh, did help each other. And yet, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence. Not only did Willard's case lack hard evidence, but he based several of his assumptions on the belief that Freemasons' oaths of mutual support could supersede the law. England's United Grand Lodge insists the oaths are never supposed to be taken to such extremes. It's impressed on every Freemason as they're going through the three ceremonies to become a Master Mason that their obligations are to God, to the law, to their families. And any obligation that they might feel they have to another Freemason comes very much down the line after that. In the case of Brian Willard, there is no proof of any Masonic conspiracy. 
only a perception that it could have happened. People misunderstand what goes on in the secrecy of the Lodge and say that it, it's nefarious, it's conspiratorial, but it, what it really is is a, um, a ritual moment that endures and has emotional power um, in the sacred context of the t Masonic Temple. Who comes here? A poor blind candidate who desires to be brought from darkness to light and receive a part of the rights and benefits of this right worshipful lodge erected to God. According to some historians, the power of the ritual derives from deeply male concerns, including the transition from boyhood to manhood and the relationships between fathers and sons. By what father right does he expect to gain a mission? By that of being a man. The heyday of the fraternal movement happened during the mid to late 19th century, as the Industrial Revolution took hold. Men, for the first time, were leaving home to go to work and leaving women to raise the children. A previously unheard of emotional distance developed between young men and their fathers. And these rituals, in essence, confirm the fears of the young man to his distant father, then work them out, ending in the young man being reconciled with his father. They embrace each other. The distant father, the young initiate, become brothers in the same family of men. According to Carnes, each Mason responds to the rituals in his own way, based on his private life. It is in this private context that the secrecy of Freemasonry has its greatest effect. He agrees with most Freemasons that for more than 250 years, critics have exposed the organization's so-called secrets. Anyone with access to a decent library can find them. The real value of secrecy, according to Carnes, is as a bond between members and a way that allows members to fully share in the ritual celebration of the nature of men and manhood. When you take the secrets of this world of mystery and you lay them out it nakedly into the world and the glare of, a, of the, the here and now of how we live, it looks goofy and silly. But in that sacred space, it makes sense. So they need to keep the space uh, protected from eavesdroppers and those who would destroy it of its mystery. For nearly 150 years, it has stood on High Street in New Haven, dark and foreboding. On the edge of the campus of Yale University, it has no windows, and its doors remain bolted to all but the initiated. It is the impenetrable command post of one of the most prestigious secret societies in the world. Its members call the building the Tomb, Headquarters of Skull and Bones. Since 1832, 15 Yale juniors, men only until the 1990s, often the most impressive members of their class, are tapped to become bonesmen. Throughout their senior year, they gather on Thursday and Sunday nights at precisely 8 p.m. Referred to within the organization as SBT, or Skull and Bones Time. Nothing that happens behind the doors of the tomb is ever supposed to be repeated, but the members say they spend those evenings eating dinner and exchanging their true feelings about themselves and the issues of the day. Discussion holds such a central position in Bones activities that Bonesmen say the number 322 on the Skull and Bones insignia refers to 322 BC, the year the Greek orator Demosthenes died. Many others claim the meetings are a boot camp for an organization that secretly controls the world's banking apparatus and its sources of political power. They also claim the skulls of Pancho Villa and Geronimo, allegedly stolen by past bonesmen, are on display in the tomb. Legend holds that all bonesmen undergo a bizarre initiation, where they lie naked in a coffin in the tomb, as they recount the intimate details of their sexual histories. The most chilling of the sagas, however, refers to the awesome power of skull and bones. These men, and now women, allegedly of privilege and descending from America's oldest and wealthiest families, are said to be invited to join a lifelong secret syndicate. 
a syndicate which many believe has engineered a criminal conspiracy among the world's most powerful elements. The alleged conspiracy would have included some of America's most influential leaders. The history of 20th century America reads like a roster of skull and bones. From William Howard Taft, the only man to serve as both president and chief justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, to financier and diplomat Averill Harriman, Time, Fortune, and Life magazine founder Henry Luce, Vietnam War architect McGeorge Bundy, and one of that war's best-known opponents, William Sloan Coffin. Concerned publisher, talk show host, and novelist William F. Buckley Jr., and former president George Bush. Skull and Bones was not always so secretive. As late as the 1920s, the New York Times even reported the results of Tap Day the day when the society chooses its new members. Not anymore. Dozens of bonesmen were contacted for this program. The rituals they performed at their tomb affected them so much that few would reveal any part of the rites. Some, however, agreed to speak off the record, and they provided a clear picture of their ultra-secret initiation ceremonies. The following is probably the most detailed recreation of a skull and bones initiation ever seen on television. Each March, the sitting class of bonesmen extend an invitation to the candidates in the succeeding class. It happens on a night called pre-tap. Before this night, prospective bonesmen have no idea that they have even been considered. Near midnight, a huge fist pounding on a dormitory room door rouses a junior from bed. He opens the door and finds someone he has never seen before. Come with me. The candidate is hustled down a hall and thrown into a room. The only light in the room comes from the candles held in front of 15 faces. Some may be familiar. A voice identifies the group as the Order of the Skull and Crossbones. You will be asked to accept or reject. One throws down a box containing names and telephone numbers of those who can answer questions about the organization. Speak of this to no one. Suddenly, the faces blow out their candles. The room turns to black as an arm pushes the candidate out the door and into the hall. He's strong-armed back to his room. About a month later, tap night falls on the Yale campus. The candidates are told to stay rooms. Another stranger appears at the door. Skull and bones, accept or reject. Accept. Come with me. If the candidate accepts, his initiation odyssey begins. One bonesman from the 1980s agreed to appear on camera to reveal parts of what he experienced, but anonymously and, at times, evasively. Someone shows up at your door. You've never seen them before, and they may say, follow me, and then you may follow them, and then there may be someone else. They may lead you to someone else. Another bonesman has described how he had to keep up with his sprinting counterpart as he ran through the campus. Eventually, the initiate arrives in the backyard of the tomb and takes a blindfold. He or she is spun and handed off. Apparently, nothing overtly physical occurs. Then the initiate is led into the tomb. Let's say someone is in a coffin. Let's say there are candles somewhere. Let's say there is Geronimo's skull. Maybe this serves to create this environment that's otherworldly. Bonesmen escort the initiate to room 322, the inner temple of Skull and Bones, a room draped in velvet and opulence, where the bonesmen hold their gatherings. There, members spin the candidate until he or she can barely stand. When the initiate gets his bearings, he sees for the first time that bonesmen old and new are packing the room. A rock for skull and bones, who wouldn't be a pirate, the whole broad sea he owns, his name the children The group suddenly bursts into one of the many songs written for and by bonesmen to be sung only in the tomb. The initiation and other bones rituals mysteriously work to convince new members that no secret told inside these walls will ever leave. Part of going through the rituals and the initiation um, is creating uh, a feeling that this is this is a sacred place. So therefore, that that creates 
this feeling of trust that having gone through this whole ritual and initiation, no one will want to break the secrecy. Bonesmen cling to that secrecy with such diligence that legends of mystery and conspiracy evolve, each neither confirmed nor denied by Skull and Bones. For those who believe the conspiracy theories of Skull and Bones, the initiation rites of the organization do much more than inculcate feelings of trust and a belief in secrecy. They provide the foundation for a lifetime of clandestine plots for power. In the summer of 1978, after graduating from Yale, Andrei Navrazov bought the country's oldest literary magazine, the nearly bankrupt Yale Lit, a journal with alleged shadowy ties to Skull and Bones. The 22-year-old Navrazov took the Lit National, gave it a full-color coffee table look, and Navrazov says eventually attracted 3,600 subscribers. It also changed radically from a showcase of student writing to what many Yale students and much of Yale's English department considered a right-wing journal, printing the works of obscure European writers, poets, and playwrights. After four years, Yale apparently had had enough and adopted rules that recategorized the lit as a non-student organization, requiring the magazine to remove the Yale name from its title. Navrazov, now an author living in London, took the university to court. During the litigation, he says he felt the power of skull and bones against him. After losing at the trial level, Navrazov claims he and his lawyer decided to argue on appeal that another non-student organization had operated the lid for decades without intrusion, namely Skull and Bones. Despite its location on the Yale campus, Skull and Bones is completely independent of the university. Navrazov would cite a book published in the 1870s and written anonymously that explained how Skull and Bones had subtly maintained control of the lid since 1864. They controlled it when it suited them, and when it didn't suit them, they, you know, they left it to, to, to lesser men. Navrazov says to prove his point in court, he would have to expose many of the secrets of Skull and Bones. Navrazov then received this letter from the most powerful bonesman in the world, the then Vice President of the United States. Dear friends, thanks so much for sending me the latest issue, which I will read with pride. I appreciate your thoughtfulness. With best wishes, sincerely, George Bush. Navrazov put his own conspiratorial spin on the letter. The aim of this, of the letter and the ensuing correspondence was to create the impression in us that uh, Bush personally would intercede with Yale and um, sort of call, have them call their, their, their legal hounds off. Navrazov believed Bush wanted to settle the case as soon as possible so the secrets of Skull and Bones would not come to light. He wrote to Bush, trying to imply that he wouldn't reveal the secrets if Bush would intercede on his behalf. Bush, in a series of letters, replied that he could not act as an intermediary. The last letter in the, in, in the series uh, is, is um, basically already a sign from him that they had had their way, and that at that point he didn't think we were going to get anywhere with this. Navrazov's skull and bones argument failed. In the spring of 1986, Navrazov lost his last appeal, turned the lid back to the students of Yale, and left New Haven for good. Did Bush, a former director of the CIA, make a subtle attempt in a seemingly innocuous note to propose a deal that would keep safe the secrets of Skull and Bones? Absolutely not, says Herb Parmet, one of the country's most respected historians and an authorized biographer of George Bush. There was nothing in that, that exchange of letters that was anything other than um, polite, typical George Bush, the kind of stuff that I have seen in every exchange of letters. One of the last things on his mind would be trying to subvert a guy who's taken over Yale's Literary Review. He followed the fortunes of it and sent a polite note. But to, to suggest anything else is mad. 
Some conspiracy theorists, besides believing that Skull and Bones runs the Yale Literary Magazine, see the members of the society as moneyed, influential soldiers in a secret war for power. They point to the late financier and diplomat, Averill Harriman, the product of an old and wealthy family, as a essential example of the omnipotent Bonesman. But only a few Bones alumni actually fit that stereotype. Eddie Santiago, a labor lawyer in Chicago and Skull and Bones class of 82, did not spend his childhood chauffeured between prep schools and his parents' estate. His parents emigrated from Puerto Rico. My dad was a working stiff at, yeah, at the steel mills, South, South Works. I, I'm a lifelong Chicagoan. We've never moved from the South Side. And I used to hang in gangs so when I was 13, 12 years old. I got busted for uh, possession of a firearm. Santiago characterizes Skull and Bones as a debating society and believes it tapped him because he could articulate a unique point of view. I think they, they saw me as being one of those individuals that would fit in, uh, I guess to fit in the radical side of, of their uh, debates because I was very radical when they tapped me. And radical, I mean I was a Marxist. Santiago thinks any theory about a postgraduate cabal of sinister bonesmen is ridiculous. The fact that it has uh, prominent members in, in industry and in law and, and other areas uh, speaks very well uh, and highly of its ability to, to select uh, some of the best minds uh, in the country. Santiago revealed that when those minds gather at the tomb, they remove all watches and timepieces to signify that time stops when the club is in session. TVs and radios are forbidden. He also said that inside the tomb, members drop their real names. Other Bonesmen have disclosed that behind the closed door, drinking alcoholic beverages is outlawed. And that inside the tomb, members take on new names from characters in the 18th century novel by Lawrence Stern, Tristram Shandy. According to one Bonesman, the biggest part of what members do inside Skull and Bones is tell the histories of their lives, trusting that their words will forever be kept in confidence. Their histories supposedly reach startling levels of state. I talked about uh, certain events in my life that I've never, never talked about before since, you know, painful things. The secrecy of the organization is part of what creates the environment that allows you to become so trustworthy and so honest with all your fellow organization members. Harvard University psychologist William Pollack says secrecy not only can encourage honesty, but also has a broader effect. The secrets are the intangible bonds between and amongst the members. The way the men hold on to each other is by holding on to the secret. Some historians and social psychologists say that whenever gender roles change, all male secret societies develop often revamping the rituals of earlier secret societies. They point to Robert Bly's Iron John Men's Movement. When they go into the woods and pound the drums, usually they're in a meet in the sweat lodge, usually there's a sort of bonding, and that's what they call it. There's a similar sort of mysticism about it, trying to recreate the primitive rituals and primitive religious ceremonies that gave existence a deeper resonance. As boundaries between men and women fall, Experts predict a diminishing need for all male secret societies. In 1991, Skull and Bones agreed to include women. They obviously share the men's interest in secrecy, but their membership signals a fundamental difference in the Bones experience, one that adapts to a new age. The young generation uh, of males, although still confused in a certain kind of way about what it means to become a man, are asking questions more publicly, are more willing to engage in public display of uncertainty, and are relying more on women as part of the process of defining masculinity. On the other hand, American Freemasons, who average about 65 years of age, hold to their all-male tradition. Having a secret society is not in and of itself thing. It only becomes a bad thing if what's going on during the secrecy is meant to be hurtful to others. But if it's meant to protect oneself or one's masculinity or one's growth, it can be a very positive thing and a very necessary thing. Will men always need places where they can get together by themselves? Yes, probably. Will it have to be secret and ritualistic? Perhaps not, and maybe not at all. 
secret societies, the supposed birthplaces of criminal conspiracy, the so-called origins of deadly plots, the purported all-powerful manipulators of events, actually exist to provide their members with a place of emotional comfort, where the secrecy and the ritual work in an unexplained way to allow a deep honesty with their brethren and themselves. Freemasonry. To some, the word suggests a harmless social club with a taste for colorful pageantry. Others envision a sinister cabal with bloody oaths and a hidden network of powerful and highly placed men. Once incredibly powerful, the Freemasons played a critical role in the birth of our nation and they help to forge a national identity. But there is also a dark side to their story, a side of the Freemasons that led to conspiracy, kidnapping, murder, and national outrage. Come with us in search of history as we uncover the amazing story of the secret brotherhood of the Freemasons. These points I solemnly swear to observe. Under no less penalty than having my throat cut across. Under no less penalty than that of having my throat cut across. My tongue torn out by the root. My tongue torn out by the root and buried at low water mark where the tide ebbs and flows. This oath is taken by all men who join the Brotherhood of Freemasons. Fourteen U.S. presidents have taken it. Among them, Gerald Ford, Harry Truman, Franklin D. Roosevelt, Andrew Jackson, and George Washington. Throughout American history, powerful and influential men have belonged to the Masonic Brotherhood. The fraternity played a powerful but little known role in the American Revolution itself. The symbols of Freemasonry are everywhere. The Washington Monument is ringed with stones that bear Masonic inscriptions, and the U.S. Capitol received a Masonic dedication. We see Masonic symbols every day on our $1 bill. Freemasonry is an organization with mysterious roots. It is generally acknowledged as a fraternity of men bound by secret oaths and rituals, intent on improving morality and building brotherhood. Throughout history, the brotherhood has also brought together men of learning and influence around common causes. The critical involvement of Freemasons began with the founding of the United States. On a December night in 1773, a group of patriots disguised as Indians boarded ships in Boston Harbor. They tossed chests of British tea into the sea to protest England's harsh taxes on her American colonies. What came to be known as the Boston Tea Party would lead to the war for American independence. Many scholars believe Masons were deeply involved in the Tea Party. Brothers were known to have met regularly at the Green Dragon Tavern, where it is more than likely that the plot was hatched. Their former lodge master was Paul Revere, an artist and patriot who made this engraving of the Boston Massacre.
Another brother was Joseph Warren, who died a hero in the Battle of Bunker Hill. Many who signed our Declaration of Independence belonged to the fraternity, most notably Benjamin Franklin and John Hancock. We hold these truths to be self-evident, declares this historic document, that all men are created equal and that all are endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These ideals were central to the Masonic worldview. Liberty, fraternity, equality. This was the, the great battle cry in the 19th century by people who believed in democracy. Well, scholars have discovered that, um, the, that if you look for a body of literature where those three terms appear most consistently and linked in some sort of way, it is Masonic literature. Freemasonry had been practiced in the American colonies by high-ranking British Army officers and gentlemen since the early 1700s. But in the years before the Revolution, a less exclusive but still very respectable fraternity created itself. Men who did not belong to polite society, who were not wealthy or powerful, were accepted. For people on the edges, Masonry would have had um, that allure of rising up in social status. And many of these men who became Masons in, in the revolutionary period were men who could not have expected to rise into that higher levels of, of society. Hoping to reap such benefits was a young man named George Washington. His elder brother had just died and he was 20 years old, attempting to make his way into the world. And it was then that he joined the Freemasons. That's something which you see again and again within early Freemasonry. It's a place for young men to establish themselves in the community. Much later, as commander of the Revolutionary Army, Washington attended the initiations of his officers into the Brotherhood. Inside his field tent, the regimental drum became an altar. Upon it were laid the three great signs of masonry, the Bible, the compass, and the square. Almost half of all officers in the American army became masons. Masonic jewels were worn like medals. But being a mason was about more than connections, pomp, and circumstance. The Brotherhood was a family away from home for men whose lives had been uprooted by war. Masonry also provides the hope that if you fall into the hands of the enemy, that you get better treatment. There's an example of an officer who was taken by Tories and by Indians. And this officer was tied to the stake and was about to be killed until he flashed his Masonic distress signal signaling that he was a Mason, and as a result, he was released. And those kind of stories are, are quite common in this period. While Masons were increasingly visible in public life, their rituals continued to take place behind closed doors, secret from all but initiates. In 1800, a skeptical young man in a small town in New York described how he too was drawn towards the fraternity. I have heard flying reports of their marvelous character. Yet my mother believes it is a black art and advises me to shun that wicked society. Something of a secret desire sprang up in my mind to see the inside of the lodge. I have determined to risk my life and will apply for entrance. Young Salem Town was deeply impressed by what he saw. Inside the lodge, he discovered a brotherhood that claimed to be no less than the divinely ordained guardian of democracy.
In order to secure those privileges, are you willing to take a solemn oath to keep inviolate the secrets and mysteries of the order? I am. Repeat your name and say after me, I, Henry Smith. I, Henry Smith. In the presence of the great architect of the universe. In the presence of the great architect of the universe. Every man who becomes a Mason endures this strange rite. Aspects of it are almost 700 years old. Secret signs and passwords have their origin in the practices of medieval stonemasons who built the great castles and cathedrals of Europe. Like other craftsmen, they belonged to a trade union or guild in which trade secrets were carefully guarded. You want to signal that you are a bona fide guild member. You have to have a word or a handshake. You can't write anything down because you can't write. So the secrecy part is maintaining quality control over the skills of its craftspeople and also a way of closing the shop. Among the buildings that the Masons constructed were Europe's great cathedrals. These soaring and magnificent structures took generations to build. They were mankind's highest technological achievement. But in the late 17th century, this medieval guild underwent a profound and mysterious transformation. Lodges began to accept members who were not practicing stonemasons. The society began to focus on spiritual and ethical ideals, and the mason's tools were transformed into symbols for living an enlightened life. The sacred writings are to govern our faith. The square is to regulate our actions, and the compass is to keep us in due bounds with all mankind. The lesser lights are the sun to rule the day, the moon, to govern the night. Becoming a Mason was now seen as a metaphorical journey from darkness into light. Having been kept in a state of darkness, what in the present situation is the predominant wish of your heart? Light. These rituals were first performed during the Age of Enlightenment a time when the rigid hierarchical and religious worldview of the Middle Ages was beginning to crumble. Freemasonry did not stress a specific religious creed, but placed great emphasis on fraternity, honor, and love of fellow man. And more than any other of the new voluntary societies that are formed, the Freemasons seem to take up this language of enlightenment. And this meant that you, you were open to new ideas, that you were interested in the new science, that you were, well, you were religious, but you were not fanatical, and that you could distinguish between what was reasonable, let's say, and what was superstitious. Strangely enough, this ultra-rationalist society also began to invent for itself a fantastic and mystical past. Freemasonry's great mystery and its central legend involves the murder of Hiram Abiff, the master mason of the ancient biblical temple of King Solomon. In the legend, which is reenacted in the mason's third degree ritual, Hiram is attacked by three ruffians who demand the secrets of the Master Mason. Our Master, true to his obligation. The third ruffian, armed with a heavy maul, aimed a violent blow at his forehead, and he fell lifeless at his feet. With Hiram's murder, the knowledge that is needed to complete the temple is lost. 
In the rite, the candidate is cast in the role of Hiram, ritually slain and then resurrected. If we think about ourselves as unfinished temples, Finding the lost word would be being able to find that link between your deity and yourself. And finding that brings all of our unfinished nature, let's say, to that point of perfection. The symbols are the mason's working tools. Each tool indicates a path to enlightenment, a way of completing the temple of one's own soul. In the years following the American Revolution, these Masons' rituals were embraced by tens of thousands of men who sought the prestige of the fraternity. Masonry pervaded every aspect of American society in the years following the Revolution. It transcended political and religious differences and was something that almost any man could subscribe to. Young men such as Salem Town were intoxicated by Masonry's mysterious lure. In 1818, he wrote, It is no secret that Masonry is of divine origin. It was divinely taught to men divinely inspired. George Washington said that America was to become what Freemasonry already was, a temple of virtues. Dozens of actual temples or public buildings were actually consecrated by Masons. Even before construction began on important buildings, town fathers sought out the fraternity to perform rites, blessing cornerstones with libations of corn, oil, and wine. In this way, the Masons acted as the high priests of the new republic. George Washington presided over probably the most famous ceremony ever. Wearing his Masonic apron and wielding a silver trowel, he dedicated the U.S. Capitol building. At this time, the United States was only 17 years old. The entire population could easily fit into a present-day city like New York while the western half of the country was seen as an uninhabitable wilderness. But the most remarkable thing was this country's government. Government by the people and for the people had never actually been tried before. The ability of America to survive was not at all clear. They were facing a hostile world. They were creating a new kind of government which hadn't been tried on that large kind of scale. And for many Americans, the, the ideals, the values, the practices of masonry provide one way of holding together that society. The Masons' lodges did actually provide practical and important training in citizenship. There's an equality of behavior within the lodge. Men are learning how to speak in public, how to vote, how to live under a constitution, how to pay taxes, how to conduct themselves as, if you like, citizens in a miniature world. Well, I think it's reasonable to, to argue that the Masonic Lodges frequently became schools for government. The discipline of the Lodge was also seen as a teaching tool. They actually would have um, uh, what they called courts. They could haul a brother up and, and um, discuss with him his behavior. He had been seen going in and out of a house of prostitution. What does this mean? Now that always stunned me when I've seen records like that because you wondered why would men willingly submit to that kind of uh, discipline? Well, I think it's part of this desire to become self-improved. By becoming a Mason, 
One was becoming associated with virtue, and virtue was heroic, respectable, and generally good for the country. Masons come to be a symbol of the larger values of the Republic in ways that other institutions can't. The revolution had upended this question of who is to be the symbol of the Republic. Before the revolution, you had the king. Now that's done away with, with this new idea of equality. So who is going to stand up and symbolize the Republic? There aren't any groups left to do that except the Masons. And, and so you bring them in. And, they, and they're particularly well suited because they are the builders symbolizing the ideals of the new nation. Journalists like Washington commentator Anne Royal sang the Masons' praises. If it were not for Freemasonry, the world would become a herd of savages. By 1826, less than 50 years after the Declaration of Independence, brothers occupied positions of power in almost every social and public institution. In 1826, murder and conspiracy would cast a dark shadow over the Brotherhood. At this time, almost every town in America had a lodge, and every lodge counted prominent figures in government and business among its members. But power bred arrogance, and this arrogance led to dark deeds. In Batavia, New York, a disgruntled mason named William Morgan was planning to publish a book on the Brotherhood's secrets. To the horror of local masons, he intended to reveal details of elaborate initiation rituals. Morgan was a stonemason by trade, a family man, and had been a captain in the army. He was also an active Freemason. But he made enemies in his lodge, where brothers accused him of drunkenness and idle ways. It's not known why he conceived of the scheme to publish Masonic secrets. Some say it was out of revenge, or that he hoped to earn a profit. Others said he was genuinely motivated to expose what he believed were dangerous and blasphemous oaths. In any event, Morgan had taken an oath that forbade him to reveal his brother's secrets. He knew that the stated penalty for breaking the oath was death in a particularly gruesome manner. These points I solemnly swear to observe. Under no less penalty than that of having my throat cut across. Under no less penalty than that of having my throat cut across. My tongue torn out by the root. My tongue torn out by the root and buried at low water mark where the tide ebbs and flows. Local Masons were alarmed and angered by Morgan's scheme. One Freemason, who later renounced the Brotherhood, wrote, I never saw men so excited in my life. They seemed to be laboring under the strongest passions and emotions. The Masons, regarded as virtuous pillars of the community, now posted an ominous notice in the newspapers. Any information in relation to Morgan can be obtained by calling at the Masonic Hall in this village. Morgan is considered to be a swindler and a dangerous man. There are people who would be glad to see this Captain Morgan. Nine days later, three Masons, accompanied by a constable, burst into Morgan's home and arrested him on trumped-up charges. They ransacked his papers and took any manuscripts they could find. Morgan was quickly released, but this was just the beginning of his troubles. Mm -hmm. 
Morgan was still determined to publish his book. Two weeks later, a vigilante group tried to burn down the printing office where Morgan's book was to be published. But neighbors raised the alarm and put out the fire before major damage was done. Events then came to a climax. Morgan was again arrested, this time for an unpaid debt of two dollars. He was taken by wagon to the nearby town of Canandaigua, where he was thrown into jail. A mysterious stranger, claiming to be a friend, appeared at the jail and paid Morgan's debt. As soon as he was released from his cell, Morgan was seized and forced into a wagon, shouting the words, murder, murder. The local newspaper reported, There is reason to fear that Captain William Morgan has been assassinated. On Tuesday evening, he was released, and at the dead and silent hour of the night, carried off by a powerful party, since which time he has not been heard of. The abduction of Morgan sent chills through the entire town. Citizens committees issued a call to action. To the public, those who do not approve of the forcibly taking away and secreting from his wife and children a man not known to be guilty of any crime are requested to meet at the courthouse at 12 o'clock noon for the purpose of adopting such measures as may be deemed appropriate. Good to see you, Mr. Barclay. Such committees convened over 100 meetings in the towns surrounding the scene of the crime. Through painstaking investigations, they traced the movements of Morgan's abductors. It was discovered that in 36 hours, the abductors traveled the incredible distance of 120 miles from the village of Canandaigua to Youngstown on the Canadian border. Along the entire route, they were aided by co-conspirators who provided food, water, fresh horses, and a change of wagons. At Youngstown, Morgan, bound and gagged, was taken across the Niagara River to Canada. But Canadian Masons refused to take responsibility for him. Morgan's captors were running out of options. The evidence suggests that they then murdered him and sunk his body in the Niagara River. The investigations carried out by the citizens committees helped lay the groundwork for the prosecution of Morgan's abductors. Two dozen local masons were arrested and indicted. Hundreds of people testified in at least 18 separate trials. But throughout the proceedings, Influential brothers used their power to block justice. The New York Masons gave money to two conspirators to help them escape to New Orleans. Another brother fled to Europe. Edward Giddings, who allegedly witnessed Morgan's murder, was banned from giving testimony. The reason? He was an atheist. The judge ruled that anyone who did not believe in a supreme being was not a competent witness. In the five counties where trials were held, it turned out that all of the sheriffs were Masons. Most used their office to select fellow Masons as jurors. There was an actual decision made in the part of some of these Masons to try to subvert this process of justice. Um, this man worked for Eli Bruce, who was one of the central conspirators, a man who was the, the sheriff of the county. And what he told his deputy to do was to pick a grand jury, which would be three-quarters Masons. 
thereby encouraging them to come up with a verdict that would not be in opposition to the interests of masonry. The extraordinary effort to subvert justice was summed up by the prosecuting counsel. Witnesses have been hidden, bribed, and warned of due process about to be served. These occurrences indicate an extensive combination to screen from punishment those charged with the offense upon William Morgan. Morgan was never found, dead or alive. Twenty-six men were charged with crimes connected to his disappearance, but only six came to trial, and only four were convicted on charges of abduction. Sheriff Eli Bruce was found to be a central conspirator. He received a jail term of only 30 months. The special counsel concludes that Morgan was taken into the Niagara River at night, about the 19th of September, and there sunk. Yet the evidence, although sufficient for all purposes of human belief, is not sufficient to establish with legal certainty the murder of Morgan. The Masons had won their battle, successfully avoiding murder charges in the case of William Morgan. But the Brotherhood would lose the war. The obstruction of justice by prominent Masons triggered a massive backlash. The murder of William Morgan shocked the nation. But far more disturbing were the Masons' repeated obstructions of justice. A national anti-Masonic movement was born out of the outrage over the Morgan affair. The anti-Masons set out to shut down lodges and banish Freemasons from any and every position in public life. Once seen as the benevolent defenders of democracy, they were now condemned as an evil power. Attacks on Masons were printed in pamphlets. Masons exercise an embarrassing and pernicious influence upon our political and business intercourse. The sign and the grip perform their sworn cabalistic office in innumerable places. Opposition spread throughout the Northeast, fueled by newspapers. By 1830, there were over a hundred newspapers in the country devoted to anti-masonry. In fact, one out of every eight newspapers in the country was an anti-masonic newspaper. Isn't it true that Mr. Morgan is Suddenly, the Masons' secrecy, exclusivity, and power made them seem incompatible with democratic society. John Quincy Adams, former president and son of John Adams, signer of the Declaration of Independence, denounce them. The Masons are a body of at least 200,000 men. It winds itself around every object of its aversion, like the boa constrictor around its victim. Secrecy must mean they're up to something bad, just by definition. All these men alone, together, immoral. Something's wrong here. They recruit among the population of their friends and so maybe in fact what they're trying to do is establish webs of patronage so they can get offices and give them to one another and keep business to themselves. Masonry no longer seemed to be a symbol of equality but of inequality. Many of the new degrees had set up officers with grandiose high-sounding titles. You could become a grand high priest. You could become a grand king. You could become an emperor. This seemed like something which was opposed to the nature of America. The anti-Masons now claim that Masonry's centuries-old rituals were demonically inspired, particularly in the use These of points, bloody I oaths. I strongly swear to observe under no less penalty than that of having my throat cut across. Under no less penalty than that of having my throat cut across. My tongue... Citing oaths such as these, anti-Masons claimed they were engaged in a struggle for the soul of America, a battle between good and evil. 
the movement against the Masons became a witch hunt. Its evils were preached from the pulpit. It is a demon and offspring of him who reigns in the bottomless pit. Oh, forsake the masonry for Christ and come out of Babylon. The masons fought back. They denied the charges against them and pointed out that all this fire and brimstone rhetoric was a cheap way for politicians to get votes. The Albany Evening Journal summed it up this way. For the first time since our glorious independence was declared, we see a party making a deliberate effort to renew the age in which men were burnt at the stake for religious belief. Not only did the anti-Masons create a witch hunt, they formed the first successful third party in American politics. It was wholly devoted to banishing Masons from public life. Political anti-Masonry began in the part of New York where Morgan had been abducted. Citizens of three towns pledged to withhold their votes from any political candidate who did not condemn the outrages against Morgan. Shortly afterward, people in the town of Seneca declared that they would not vote for a Freemason for any political office whatsoever. A year after Morgan's disappearance, anti-Masons had been elected to town and county offices all over western New York State. State legislators who were Masons feared the turning tide of public opinion. They appointed special counsels to lead an investigation into the Morgan affair. By satisfying the public's demand for justice, they hoped to quell the growing tendency to blame the entire Masonic fraternity for murder and conspiracy. But this strategy backfired. Three successive special counsels, repeatedly blocked in their attempts to get to the truth, became supporters of the anti-Masons. Unchecked, political anti-Masonry spread like wildfire. Anti-Masons resolved to create their own national independent political party, separate from Republicans or Democrats. The Antis were also the first political party devoted to a single issue, the total destruction of Freemasonry. They elected governors in Vermont and Pennsylvania and held the first national convention in American history to nominate a president. Their candidate carried a respectable 8% of the vote in the general elections. The anti-Masonic campaign devastated the Brotherhood that had seen itself as the guardian of democracy. Once powerful, now reviled, Freemasons were barred from public office. Respectable men severed all connections with the Brotherhood. The number of Masons in America drops enormously. Um, Vermont is forced to simply give up its Grand Lodge, its state body. Illinois and Michigan, their Grand Lodges simply collapse. They're gone. Um, in, in upstate New York, at least three quarters of all the lodges um, simply stop meeting. So it's an extraordinary uh, movement which does away with the institution which before 1826 would have seemed impregnable, but yet it occurs. Then, in the 1850s, the pendulum reversed direction the fraternity began to make a comeback. The new Freemasons were different from what they had been. They distanced themselves from their former reputation as a secret cabal.
The new Masonic lodges functioned primarily as social clubs without the claims of divine inspiration or political power that characterized them in the past. Charity was emphasized, and the new fraternity earned a reputation for its homes for the elderly, hospitals, and orphanages. Long before Social Security, Masonic charities were a last resort for many poor and homeless. Today, there are two and a half million members of the free and accepted order of Masons in America. For some, the local lodge is a place for friendship and fraternity, where men of goodwill can join forces on charitable projects. For others, there is a deeper, more elusive meaning. The enigmatic craft still uses its ancient symbols and strange rituals. Sometimes frightening, sometimes reassuring. They are passed down from generation to generation as guideposts on the path to wisdom and enlightenment. Their ultimate meaning may only be understood when we go in search of history. existing secret society, the Freemasons. Throughout their long history, they've been suspected of plotting to take over the world, accused of fomenting bloody revolution in England, France, and America, reviled as devil worshipers, who stole the ancient treasure of King Solomon to fund their diabolical schemes. The Freemasons insist they're just a civic-minded fraternity, bound together by secret and elaborate, but ultimately harmless, rituals. What is the truth about the Freemasons? What are their secrets? And why, when it comes to the Freemasons, is fact often stranger than fiction? Behind every closed door lies a mystery. For the Freemasons, the hidden history begins inside a sacred temple 1,000 years before Christ, with the shadowy figure at the heart of Freemasonry, Hiram Abiff, also known as the Widow's Son. There is no one version of the Hiram Abiff legend, just as there is no one version of, of, of any legend. According to the Freemasons, the widow's son of Hiram Abiff is the master builder of King Solomon's temple. The temple will house the stone tablets inscribed with the Ten Commandments and the holy presence of God himself. According to Freemason legend, Israel's King Solomon has received the design directly from God. Hiram, too, knows the secrets of the divine plan. In the story, Hiram Abiff is accosted by three junior workers who are jealous of the fact that they have not been uh, given all the secrets of masonry, and they try to extort them from Hiram Abiff. The workers believe that a single secret code word 
will give them Hiram's knowledge of God's divine plan and with it, magical powers. Each one of the three assailants of Hiram is constantly asking for the secret word. And Hiram keeps telling them, you know, this is strange, why are you asking for this? Every day at noon, Hiram leaves the worksite to pray. So the three workers lie in wait at the temple's three doors. As Hiram approaches the east door, the first man stops him and demands the secret. Hiram replies that when the temple is finished, he will be told the secret word. The word is given in recognition of accomplishment. When a mason has proved himself as an apprentice and as an expert craftsman, he's then recognized by being given the word of a master mason. Rebuked, the man slashes at Hiram's throat with a sharpened stone. Hiram escapes, but at the south door, the second man demands the secret. Again, the wounded Hiram refuses and is struck with a mason square. Hiram staggers to the west door. Again, the demand. Again, he refuses and is finally dealt the death blow. As he dies, he cries, who will help the widow's son? The phrase will become the Freemasons' universal cry for help from brother Masons. Hiram Abiff's refusal to give up his secret knowledge to the undeserving makes him the greatest of Freemason heroes. Hiram Abiff represents the Freemason. That is, the builder who is free, who has a free mind, uh, you know, and that means freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of movement, you know, all these liberties that we cherish today. So you're a builder and a free one, and you're always, always under attack by three major enemies, ignorance, fanaticism, and tyranny. Outside the Bible, there is little evidence that either Hiram Abiff or Solomon's Temple ever existed. Yet today, each of the 15,000 Masonic lodges around the world is designed after the biblical description of Solomon's Temple. The Masons wear ritual costumes that have symbolic ties to the Temple. And within their lodge's secret most chamber, they reenact the ritual murder of Hiram Abiff. What you're seeing is a recreation of the initiation rite of a master mason. The exact contents of the ceremony remain a secret, but the History Channel was able to create this scene with the help of present and former Freemasons. When I joined, the rituals were just as bad as crazy as I thought they would be. I asked everybody what they meant, and the answer was, well, you'll find out, don't worry. And over the next two, three years, it became evident that they hadn't a clue. Nobody knows what those rituals are about. So it started me in my quest to try and understand them uh, further. To have my body, have cut, my into, body cut into, my bowels my removed bowels and burned. The candidate swears a solemn oath never to reveal what transpires in this room on pain of death. Then, playing the role of Hiram, he is struck with three ritualized blows and simulates death. It is an allegorical story of fidelity, of integrity, of keeping your word and your bond. Two times, other Masons try to revive him, but in vain. The third time, they succeed, and the candidate rises, reborn as a master Mason. It is to teach the Mason the importance of the immortality of the soul. And in so doing, a Mason should not only strive to develop himself physically and intellectually, but also spiritually and esoterically. It is about death and resurrection, which is at the heart of the concept of Freemasonry. Each Freemason is physically resurrected from a symbolic death. It's all allegorical. And this is, this is what 
people will never understand. It is really an individual secret. There is no secret for the fraternity and for Freemasonry. It is an individual secret that is hidden inside each and every Mason. And that is of great importance to the Mason, whether it's a he or she. And I mention she, by the way, because although in Europe there are many more fem uh, female Masons, uh, women Masons, in the United States they have more of a, of a um, auxiliary body. However, feminine Freemasonry has already been introduced to the United States by the Europeans. Today, close to three million Freemasons are spread all over the world, forming the world's oldest existing secret society. Many are educated men, civic leaders, movers and shakers in their communities. Some of the world's most powerful men have been members. Winston Churchill, Henry Ford, Duke Ellington, the philosopher Voltaire, and Mozart, all were Freemasons. And in America, nine signers of the Declaration of Independence, George Washington, and 13 other U.S. presidents have been Freemasons. That concentration of power within a secret society has led to the most sinister of conspiracy theories. Right from the beginning, right from the time Freemasonry becomes a fraternity, there's nervousness about an order which is not only secret, but talks about being secret. Are these guys taking over the country? Do they have their own secret plot or something? There are many anti-Masonic conspiracy theories that we are the secret controllers of government and industry worldwide. There's also a theory out there that the secret inner circle of Freemasonry worships Satan. Didn't you know that it was a Jewish Masonic imperialist conspiracy that killed Lady Di? You find that on the internet. When you tell them that it just doesn't happen, they, they just simply say, well, you don't know yet, you're not high enough. I guess the best case you could make that the Masons are dangerous and sinister is that we've been around for centuries, located everywhere, that men of power and import have belonged to us, and we meet privately. However, I'd like to add, if we can't agree on whether to serve ham sandwiches or, or, or tuna sandwiches after the meeting, how can we possibly agree to take over the world? And yet the Freemasons have been the focus of fear and mystery right from their beginnings centuries ago, when Europe was plunged into the Dark Ages, and those few Freemasons who retained their secret skills built the great cathedrals, laying the groundwork for the secret society. One of the keys to the Freemason secret society lies buried in the saga of the first Freemasons, the great cathedral builders of Northern Europe. In the Middle Ages, these illiterate working men possessed the astonishing ability to transform raw stone into shimmering godly palaces. I think that building in stone has always been considered to be something akin to God. Major buildings tended to be temples and cathedrals, and the skills and knowledge to build them stemmed from geometry, which itself stemmed from astronomy, and astronomy was the heavens where the stars are, where the gods, or God, is, and there was this thread of godliness. Their almost magical skills earned the stonemasons a special place in medieval Europe. They were free to travel across any border to wherever the work took them. For this rare privilege of freedom of movement, they were known as free stonemasons. When a newcomer arrived at a work site, he faced a test. To prove his standing, he approached the master and shook his hand. Each of the three levels of skill, apprentice, journeyman, and master, had its own secret grip. The Freemason Secret Society would adopt the stonemason's handshakes as their own. A 19th century book 
claims to reveal the secret handshakes. The grip of the entered apprentice is made by pressing the thumb against the top of the first the knuckle joint of the, the fellow thumb. craft is taken as in an ordinary handshake, and the mason presses the top of his thumb of against the space mason between firmly the first grasps the right hand of a fellow mason. The thumbs of both hands are interlaced. This grip is also called the strong grip, or the lion's paw. The handshakes were created in the stonemasons' guilds, the medieval precursor of the trade union. Inside the guild, the culture was democratic. Every mason, from the richest master to the lowliest apprentice, addressed the other as brother. The tradition of equality is represented among modern Freemasons by the medieval stonemason symbol of the level. The level is to remind the mason that there are people of different cultures, different backgrounds, different professions. Yet in the lodge, we all meet on the level. That's where it comes from in the English language, being on the level or level with me. It comes from the Masonic teaching. You end up on the level. And it doesn't matter how great you are or how insignificant you are. Everyone is going to the same place. You're, you're going to the grave. The simple tools of the medieval stonemasons gave them a power beyond even their own understanding. The stone frame for this window at Jedburgh Abbey in Scotland was built without formula or equations, designed with a few turns of the master mason's compass. The stonemasons favored particular proportions, such as the ratio we now understand as 1.414 to 1. That's the ratio of the length of Jedburgh Abbey to the length of its nave. This ratio wasn't just considered pleasing to the eye. It was held as sacred, creating a mystical connection with the power of God Geometry was often seen as more than a branch of mathematics. It was the all-powerful road to the divine. Today, the stonemason's combination of math and mysticism lives on in the secret society of Freemasons. I think at the heart of Freemasonry is this unstable, mixture of, of two different views of the world. On one hand, you have the view that the world is complicated, it's mysterious, that people in the past knew things that we didn't know today. On the other hand, you have another view of the world, that it's simple, that it's based upon rules, and it's essentially mathematical. And what Freemasonry does is it takes these two views, which have now in our culture become separated, and it keeps them together. The medieval stonemason's mix of scientific skill, mystical thinking, and democratic freedoms would prove irresistible to a radical new brand of thinker emerging in Europe, the scientists and philosophers of the Enlightenment. In the 18th century, these high-born gentlemen would take over the free stonemason's guild, and with it, create a force that would change the world. The secret society of Freemasons was born out of the Stonemasons Guild sometime in the 1600s. The exact details of this strange transformation remain a mystery. We know that in 1599, when we have the oldest extant minutes of a lodge in Scotland, that they are very definitely meeting as a labor union. And we know in 1717, when the four old lodges come together in London, they're now gentlemen's clubs. So during the 1600s, something happened. 
What happened was the enormous upheaval in political and intellectual life known as the Enlightenment. In Britain, men like Isaac Newton turned away from church dogma and towards science and reason as ways to understand the world. Freemasonry is rooted in this period when science is becoming the center of learned culture. The center of science in this period is the Royal Society. And by the early 18th century, it was being headed by Sir Isaac Newton. They were intending to create a new belief system, a new cosmology, a new way of looking at the world, more fitting with their own experience. Using only mathematics and observation, Newton constructed a system of rational laws that explained the workings of the natural world without need of God's direct intervention. But for Newton, the laws of gravity and motion did not explain everything. Newton and Freemasonry share things, not only of a view of the world, which is mathematical, which is scientific, but also an interest in the ancient world and the mystical origins of humanity. Newton, the scientist, was also a devoted alchemist in search of a chemical process to create the Philosopher's Stone, a magical substance that would cure disease, heal the soul, extend life, and turn base metals into gold. He grew obsessed with the biblical description of Solomon's temple believing that its design must hold ancient wisdom and perhaps the secret recipe for the Philosopher's Stone. Whilst a lot of this is theological and fanciful, in my view, a lot of it is science too, very ancient science. So there is a period in ancient history where the two became mixed together, uh, where science and theology uh, were two halves of the same thing. Newton drew up detailed diagrams of Solomon's temple reconstructed its geometry, made predictions of the future by interpreting its dimensions, but failed to discover the Philosopher's Stone. Enlightenment ideas had a profound effect on politics as well. Parliament executed Charles I in 1649 for tyranny, set up a short-lived republic, and eventually a limited monarchy. King Louis XIV and the rest of Europe's absolute monarchs faced a direct challenge. Throughout Europe, police suppressed Enlightenment views, and the church turned its attention to this new and powerful threat. If you were a person of science, if you were a person who favored liberal, humanistic, tolerance, uh, separation of church and state, you ran the risk of being on the other side of a political or religious inquisition. We must remember that in the medieval times, people didn't even own their bodies. If the church wanted to torture them, the inquisition for some reason, that was sort of okay because they didn't own their bodies. To avoid persecution, the modern-minded men hunted for safe places to meet, and some found the Stonemasons Guild whose democratic values and practices seem to embody Enlightenment ideals to an astonishing degree. For the stonemasons, these new gentlemen masons provided a new respectability. If you think about the 18th century Freemason lodges as sort of revolutionary coffee houses, the ideas that are developing here are tolerance, brotherhood, egalitarianism, these are ideas that are new ideas in that time period. Over time, the gentlemen displaced the workers, and in January 1717, at a pub in London, Isaac Newton's friend Jean de Salier founded the first Freemason Grand Lodge, named for the covered shed at every medieval construction site where the stonemasons ate and drank. The Freemason's basic charter made religious tolerance its first rule, a radical idea at the time. Masons elected their leaders democratically, a notion that would soon have sweeping impact. The Masons embellished the legend of Hiram Abiff, the free builder, and created an extensive language of symbols aimed at developing moral character and improving society. 
There are so many symbols in Freemasonry that it's difficult to say which are the most important. The square reminds me to square my actions by the square of virtue. The compasses tells me that I should circumscribe my passions. The letter G stands for geometry, which was in the center of the Mason's life, or God, who is in the center of the Freemason's life. The letter G refers to the supreme being, uh, the grand architect of the universe. And we use that term to emphasize uh, freedom of religion because people can define that supreme being any way they want. The Catholic Church condemned Freemasonry almost as soon as it began. In 1738, Pope Clement XII issued the first of what would become over the centuries a torrent of papal bulls attacking the Freemasons. The secret societies called the Freemasons are depraved and perverted. They pose a great danger to the souls of the faith. Therefore do we command most strictly that no Catholic shall dare to enter, propagate, or support these Freemasons under pain of excommunication. The church tried everything in its power to halt this force, which we almost can't imagine today the power of that political force. It, it caught like a wildfire because it represented a new way of thinking about the world that was the wave of the future. Soon, democratic revolutions would wipe the old order away. And the secret society of Freemasons would be at the heart of it all. Benjamin Franklin was at the center of the diplomatic movement of the American Revolution. He belongs to a Masonic lodge in France, to the Lodge of the Nine Sisters. In fact, Benjamin Franklin escorts Voltaire, the greatest Enlightenment figure of France. He escorts him into the lodge at a special meeting. So here you have the two of the key figures of the Enlightenment, and where do they meet? In the Masonic Lodge. The accepted history of the Freemasons links the secret society back to medieval stonemasons. But a deep tradition holds that the true roots of the society trace back to a 3,000-year-old history tied to the legendary white knights of the Crusades, the Knights Templar. The structure that I see is that the rituals used by Freemasons today came from the Knights Templar. And the Knights Templar got them from uh, the priests of Jerusalem at the time of Christ. Like the Freemasons, the Knights Templar have been a source of fascination and mystery for centuries. As the Pope's special soldiers of Christ, they killed countless thousands of infidels, mostly Muslims, during the Crusades, and grew to great wealth and power in medieval Europe. But they began with a solitary group of nine Frenchmen who traveled to the Holy Land in the year 1118, ostensibly to protect Christian pilgrims. Once in Jerusalem, they were housed at Al-Aqsa Mosque, ground zero for the Freemasons. Al-Aqsa was built directly on top of the ruins of the Jewish temples that preceded it, including, according to tradition, the central icon in all of Freemasonry, the Temple of Solomon. It was known in medieval times that the Templars housed their horses in underneath the southeastern platform in the area called Solomon's Stables. So the Templars were involved in cleaning out this area, and that was an extensive job. On this much, historians agree. But since the Middle Ages, rumors and legends have held that the Templars chose their dirty stables to dig for buried treasure. Solomon's gold, the plunder of ancient Rome, the Holy Grail, and perhaps the lost secrets of the ancient Jewish sect called the Essenes, whose strange rituals told the secret of how man might communicate with God directly, as King Solomon had. 
For author and Freemason Christopher Knight, these Essene documents, written by the authors of the Dead Sea Scrolls, were the real treasure. They lived on charity, they had no income, and they just worked night and day digging. They found their documents over those nine years, um, and their treasures, and within months they were fabulously rich. Treasure hunters or not, the Templars returned to Europe in 1127 and quickly gained the sponsorship of the church. Their group soon expanded in number to include 1,200 knights and more than 20,000 retainers. They diversified their services, inventing early forms of banking, shipping, and security. Within a generation, they were a powerful international force. The Knights Templar were really the first multinational banking concern and multinational corporation of sorts. Strangely, the Templar rules stipulated that their meetings could take place only at night. Perhaps similar to a board meeting today, you know, the outsiders were not allowed, so that opened up questions about what was really happening. And within just a handful of years, rumors were spreading that they were conducting strange rituals, which were apparently not Christian. These rituals, argues Christopher Knight, must have come to the Templars from the scrolls they discovered under the temple. Rituals that served as the basis for the rebirth of an ancient religious practice that bonded the Templars together in strength and in secrecy, a bond soon to be shared with the Freemasons. The Templars embarked on a massive building program, employing freestone masons to build the great cathedrals at Chartres, Notre Dame, and many others across Europe. The Templar families had to bring in stonemasons and turn these people into perhaps like something like lower level Templars. They had to give them a ritual, uh, so they were bound to secrecy also. Christopher Knight believes the Templars' powerful rituals live on in the Freemason rituals of today, but that the meaning has been lost. There is one very good reason why Freemasonry created this aura of secrecy. That is because of the rituals they conduct. They don't know why they conduct them. So if you're open with somebody and say, well, yes, I went to this ritual and I had one trouser leg rolled up and I had my, my, my chest out of here and I was blindfolded and a noose around my neck and a knife to my chest and, oh, right, yeah, that's pretty weird. Why did you do that? I don't know. Well, you're gonna sound a fool. So you pretend it's secret. In medieval Europe, the Templars' power would not last. In 1307, the King of France, plotting to seize the Templar fortune, sent out orders to strike down the Templars in a single day. It was early in the morning at dawn that the frightening knock on the door came. <coughs> Suddenly, the stampede began. The initial shock became um, a, a shock wave across all of Europe. It's like every single company director of every corporation or government had been rounded up at dawn. It happened on Friday the 13th, 1307. Some folklorists today believe that the Friday the 13th superstition may originate from the Templar arrest. Propter malum suesunus. This order has aroused my anger and wrath because of the evil of its sons. They fell into the unforgivable sin of Pope Clement V, an ally of the king, condemned the Knights Templar. They were charged with blasphemy, heresy, spitting on the cross. They were accused possibly of worshiping a cat or a severed head, and um, something called, allegedly called Baphomet. The exact meaning of the Baphomet idol remains a mystery. The word may refer to Muhammad, or to the Greek words Baphi and Metis, the baptism of wisdom. Through the centuries, Baphomet has become a powerful figure in satanic and occult practice. The most terrible thing they could be accused of really was denying the divinity of Christ and the power of the cross. They never sought to deny that. And they were tortured pretty horribly. 
In 1312, after five years of trials and bloody executions, the Pope disbanded the Knights Templar by decree. The order slipped into history, or did it? Not all of the Templars were rounded up, or perhaps could have been, because there were so many thousands of them. The Templars went underground all over Europe, and they did, as a matter of fact, create other offshoot secret societies and tried to keep some of their traditions alive. Some say that some of them went and infiltrated the Mason guilds so they could travel freely. For Christopher Knight, the place the Knights Templar brought their secret knowledge and their sacred scrolls was Rosslyn Chapel in the Scottish Lowlands. Masonic ritual describes how King Solomon met with his leading priests in a chamber underneath King Solomon's temple. Now, Rosalind has exactly that, and Masonic ritual describes exactly that. Can't be coincidence. The mysterious Rosslyn Chapel just outside of Edinburgh is the centerpiece of a controversial theory that sees the Freemasons as the modern-day descendants of the medieval Knights Templar and of an ancient religious sect. Rosalind is hugely important. It's a key to understanding Masonic ritual. The Masonic rituals that we use today, the, the, certainly the important ones, and Rosalind Chapel are two halves of the same thing. One unlocks the other. Rosslyn is covered with intricate carvings and sculpture, imagery so plentiful and often so obscure that the exact purpose of the chapel has long been the subject of speculation. Rosslyn was the personal project of William St. Clair, a 15th century nobleman, the official patron of the local stonemasons guild. And according to the inscription added to his tomb long after his death, a Knight Templar, a hotly disputed claim. We have no documentable evidence William St. Clair was ever a Knight Templar. The suppression of the Templar Order was in 1312, but Roslyn wasn't started until 1446, well beyond that time frame. Did the Templars build Roslyn Chapel? The answer is a definitive no. But the Templars did have a fortress near Rosslyn, and the Templars did try to survive as a secret society. In search of Templar connections, thousands now flock to Rosslyn every year, thanks to the chapel's featured role in the best-selling novel, The Da Vinci Code. The staff is more than willing to point to any possible Templar connection. One of the most intriguing ones, perhaps, is just behind me on the window here, the image of the Knight Templar on a horse and behind him a passenger. It's indicative of the Knight Templars in as much as they invariably had somebody on the horse behind them. It was kind of their, like being a boy scout really, you always had a buddy to look after. With the spear and the cross on the back, that's very much a Templar image. Christopher Knight argues that the entire chapel was meant to be a recreation of Solomon's Temple a signal to underground Knights Templar across the world that their ancient cult would rise again. He points to the half-built west wall of the chapel, a copy, he believes, of Jerusalem's Wailing Wall, and to the overall design, which Knight believes was based on the structure that rose to replace the Temple of Solomon, Herod's Temple. Rosalind Chapel is a one-third scale uh, copy of the Herodian Temple. When you marry together the foundations of Rosalind and overlay them with the Herodian Temple in Jerusalem, they are the same, they're perfect. It is an exact copy. The Freemason connection to Rosalind begins with Solomon's Temple, site of the central Freemason legend of Hiram Abiff, the master murdered by jealous apprentices. At Rosslyn, a corresponding myth centers on the spectacular and strange apprentice pillar. 
Um, it's, it's thought that William Sinclair had been to Rome and seen a pillar which he just thought was so exquisite he wanted to have replicated in his chapel. So he went to his master mason and said, I've seen a pillar and I would like you to build it for me. Master Mason felt it was such a responsibility that he had to go to Rome to see the original before he could build it. And during that time, one of the apprentices had a dream. And in this dream, he was told how to build the pillar. And he also saw himself completing it. And William Sinclair, fearing that his Master Mason may never return from Rome, authorized the apprentice to do it. And this is what he produced. the master mason did return. And on his arrival, when he saw the beautiful pillar, clearly enraged with envy, he gave him a smash across the forehead with a mallet, killing him instantly. So the apprentice dies from just the kind of blow that killed Hiram Abiff. All of the other apprentices then turned on the master mason and killed him on the spot. So the other apprentices decided that this story shouldn't be forgotten. So they carved faces from the story on the interior of the chapel. That's actually the face of the apprentice. You can see that there is actually a big gash on the upper right-hand side of his forehead where the fatal mallet struck. And directly opposite, worn smooth by age, is the face of the master mason who, rather ironically, will be forced forever to look diagonally across the chapel at the apprentice pillar. And other carvings may refer to the Freemasons. The unusual postures of these figures match exactly the curled position of a candidate in a Freemason initiation ritual. And there is more. Perhaps the most single important item is a little carving that stands about that high. Um, which shows a candidate being initiated, um, one would say, into Freemasonry. Um, because this is long before Freemasonry. There's a noose around the person's neck, which is part of the requirement for a, the first degree in Freemasonry. And it's been held by someone who appears to be a Templar, with the Templar cross on his chest and the beard. And the points of convergence between the modern ritual of the first degree and this are so many that statistically it's impossible for it not to be directly connected in some way. Mainstream scholars dismiss Knight's theory. Rosslyn, they say, is an amalgam of Christian, Celtic, and other folklore-based legends. William St. Clair's attempt to preserve a threatened cultural heritage. Sir William foresaw the possible danger that certain belief systems or thoughts or images that had been previously burned in many inquisitional book burnings through the Middle Ages might not get preserved for posterity. So Roslyn is a Bible or a book in stone. These carvings present perhaps the greatest Roslyn mystery. They are identified as maize, corn, found only in the New World, carved 50 years before Columbus set sail. A 500-year-old legend has it that William St. Clair's grandfather, Sir Henry, was a Knight Templar who led an expedition to the New World and brought back corn, which his grandson celebrated in these carvings. We asked a botanist from the university to give us his opinion of this. And when he looked at them, he wasn't convinced until he found one more plant in Roslyn Chapel, a small plant, and he said, if you've got that one, then I'm prepared to believe that the other ones are genuine because this plant would only have been found in the New World. The plant's name is the prairie trefoil. The evidence for the Templar presence in America is circumstantial at best, and at present dismissed by mainstream scholars. I personally think that while the evidence is, is very romantic and makes a great tale, that there's nothing there that supports it factually. A wonderful legend and, and a wonderful myth, and I put it in the camp of sort of Greek myths, great story, great narrative, uh, highly unlikely. But the vision of Knights Templar in America, 
turn to Freemasons in America persists. I think it's reasonable to suggest that the United States of America is, in part at least, the, the triumph of Freemasonry. The ideals of equality and openness of thinking that were inside this early Jewish priesthood, they used those Masonic ideals to create this new utopia where everybody would be free, the land of the free. Freemasons Ben Franklin, George Washington, Paul Revere, and others would all play crucial in roles reading. in the American Revolution. In Congress, July 4th, 1776. So crucial that they would give rise to the suspicion that America itself was a secret Masonic project. For hundreds of years, suspicions of a plot to take over America have swirled around the Freemasons, the world's oldest secret society. Freemasons led the revolution, played critical roles in the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the design of our nation's capital. The untold story of the Freemasons in America reveals secret codes, patterns taken from the stars, murder, and a radically new picture of the nation's founding fathers. Washington, D.C., one of the most photographed cities in the world. Its monuments are powerful and familiar, its history well known. Or is it? In recent years, a gathering storm of suspicions has brought renewed interest in an old idea, that the United States is somehow under the control of a powerful secret society, an innocent-seeming worldwide civic organization with nearly two million members in the United States, the Freemasons, and that Washington, D.C. is ground zero for that conspiracy. We know that Dan Brown, the author of The Da Vinci Code, intends to set his sequel to The Da Vinci Code against the backdrop of Freemasonry and some of these interesting histories and mysteries that go back to the founding of America. The symbols that reveal the Freemasons' presence, whisper the rumors, are all around us, hidden in plain sight. Some are obvious, like the compass and square, a public sign found on every Freemason lodge. The G in the center refers, the Freemasons say, to God, the grand architect of the universe. Other Freemason symbols are more subtle. Even on the dollar bill, the theories allege, are secret codes understood by Freemasons everywhere to mean that the plot to take over America is going well. Scholars find the idea ludicrous. They build this conspiracy theory and they weave it together until it's a huge giant thing. The Masons are just an element of it because it includes the CIA, the KGB, the PTA, and every other alphabet thing. Of course they include the Masons because the Masons have secrets. Anti-Masons talk a lot about the Masons trying to take over the world, the new world order, you know. Do they really think that people like George Washington, like Benjamin Franklin, were engaged in a conspiracy to take over the world? The truth about the Freemasons in America may be even stranger than the conspiracy theories. The story begins in England, in the days of the founding Freemason fathers. No one knows exactly how it happened, but the medieval Free Stone Masons Guild was transformed in the 1700s by politically minded noblemen into an entirely separate organization. These new Freemasons wanted a secret club to advance their own blend of Enlightenment ideals, science, reason, equality, and freedom of thought. I think it's important to see Freemasonry as a repository of intellectual knowledge, scientific knowledge, that by definition had to develop as a secret society because of the hegemony 
of the church in earlier times. In the late 1730s, the Pope issues a papal bull stating that Roman Catholics cannot join the fraternity because Freemasonry at its heart is about breaking down religious barriers. It's bringing together people of different religious origins. And for people who believe that the, the church is the center of things and that other organizations dilute it, Freemasonry is a frightening kind of thing. It caught like a wildfire because it represented a new way of thinking about the world that was the wave of the future. Great thinkers like Voltaire in France, people like Mozart composing the Magic Flute, which is a Masonic allegory. Adam Smith, uh, David Hume, people we associate with the ideas that then led to the American Revolution. Benjamin Franklin was one of the first Americans to join the secret society. He underwent the bizarre ritual of the Freemason initiation ceremony in Philadelphia in 1731. These rituals used by Freemasons are undoubtedly of ancient Jewish origin, very old Jewish origin, going back to the time of Solomon, 3,000 years probably. It is about death and resurrection, which is at the heart of the concept of Freemasonry. Each Freemason is physically resurrected from a symbolic death. The Freemasons' secrecy and acceptance of men of different religious groups made them targets of suspicion. In the 1730s in America, there's a good deal of talk, what is masonry secret? It mattered if you were a Presbyterian or if you were a Baptist. So, so masonry, in blurring those kind of lines, seems to many people to be upending some of the, some of the foundations of society. Freemasonry spread throughout the colonies. By the 1770s, revolution was in the air, with American Freemasons like Paul Revere taking the lead. The Boston Tea Party is one point at which you can see Freemasons actually um, being closely involved with one of the central events of the American Revolution. Because we know the Green Dragon Tavern in Boston, the meeting place of one of the key groups of Masons. This is the center of a lot of the meetings about the Tea Party. In fact, there's a drawing of the Green Dragon Tavern from this period that actually somebody has written on there. This is where we planned what becomes the Boston Tea Party. Paul Revere, John Hancock, and Joseph Warren are all members of the Lodge. Okay, we're talking about firebrand liberals. This Lodge doesn't meet that night. It's actually written in the minutes that we were involved with the tea. One cannot truly understand how the American experiment came to be, how the ideals of the American Revolution flourished without studying the role of Freemasonry. Masons are dangerous. A Mason learns that he or she has a free will. A Mason is very dangerous when it comes to systems of government that try to oppress the free mind of an individual. With the Mason-influenced revolution underway and the new nation defining itself, Freemason Ben Franklin suggested an important change to Thomas Jefferson's draft of the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable. The word sacred bothered Franklin, by now the grand master of the Pennsylvania Freemasons. Still. A Freemason's America, in accordance with advanced Enlightenment ideas, would be bound by reason, not by faith. Franklin found a more acceptable word, self-evident. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. The Declaration of Independence is part of the same intellectual world as early Freemasonry. It's a world where God still exists, but you don't emphasize the specific things that divide you about religion. These individuals were not primarily Christians in their belief system. They saw themselves as Christians in a very broadly defined light. They talked about divine providence. They didn't talk about God. They talked about uh, belief in man and the importance of doing good works on, in this life, on this earth. They talked about tolerance. 
progress, the need for men to band together to change society. Of the 56 men to sign the Declaration of Independence, nine were openly Freemasons, including the presiding officer, John Hancock. But America's most important founding Freemason was none other than George Washington. The fact that Washington is a Freemason is of enormous significance. George Washington joined, even when he was just 20 years old, so anxious was he to join the fraternity. With the War for Independence underway, General Washington struggled to transform the ragtag Continental Army into a unified fighting force. Freemason lodges set up inside army camps provided a place for discussion and the roots of the first truly American identity. You found that religious organizations were largely segregated by colony with Calvinists to the north, Quakers in, in the middle, Anglicans to the south. Uh, but Freemasonry was a group that uh, transcended the boundaries. It provides a common bond of friendship that is so essential in maintaining esprit de corps. About 40% of all the officers belonged to the fraternity and quite often met within lodges that were held in the army camps. But the war did not begin well for the Americans. Washington knew that without more supplies and better officers, the revolution was doomed. Washington's Freemason brother, Ben Franklin, took care of that problem, persuading the King of France to enter the war on America's side. Franklin was an ambassador to Paris, to France, and, and you hear, of course, in Techwell, he used his connections in France. What were those connections? He was a Freemason. He was very active in Freemasonry. In fact, Benjamin Franklin guided Voltaire in his initiation in the Lodge of the Nine Muses in Paris. I mean, he was so well connected. He used the Masonic network to recruit great generals and officers from around Europe who were willing to come, serve under another Mason, George Washington, fight for the ideals of the American Revolution because those were also Masonic ideals. Help came from German Baron von Steuben, a Freemason who guided Washington's troops through the hardships of Valley Forge, and the Marquis de Lafayette, a Freemason who helped lead America to the ultimate victory over the British at Yorktown. Without the Freemason leadership, the revolution might never have been won. With Washington there and with so many other figures, by the time the revolution is over, most Americans have come to see masonry as a peculiarly patriotic, nationalistic organization. America was free. When Washington swore his oath of office in 1789 on a Bible borrowed from a Masonic lodge held by a fellow Mason, the fraternity had a unique opportunity to help shape their new nation and they took it. As Americans learn about Freemason history and the founding of this country, they will find some of the episodes to be shocking, strange, bizarre. In the first days of the Republic, President George Washington, a Freemason worshipful master, took a strong hand in designing the capital city that would bear his name. George Washington, he's intimately involved with his creation, the creation of this new capital city right near his home. In the summer of 1791, the president hired a Revolutionary War veteran, Major Pierre Charles L'Enfant, to work on the design of the city. L'Enfant's plan would reflect Washington's deepest beliefs, starting with the Freemason president's insistence that the district be set on an exact 10-mile square. The city was designed scientifically and geometrically. Why? To send a very important message that unlike the old order, where the reliance was on religion mainly to govern the affairs of the people, under the new order, the reliance is going to be mainly on reason, the scientific method, geometry, to govern the affairs of the people. Many hands would get involved, 
Thomas Jefferson drew the initial street plan, an uncompromising grid. L'Enfant added the distinctive radial streets, shooting off at angles from focal points like the Capitol. Andrew Ellicott, Benjamin Banneker, and others would all contribute, none known to be Freemasons, but to many members of the fraternity, the result reflects a uniquely Freemason vision of America. It reflects ideals of architecture and masonry espoused by the fraternity. You can see the various uh, symbols of geometry that we use in Freemasonry. The triangle, the concept of the three, the square, the concept of the four. The Freemasons used countless shapes and symbols to educate initiates in the ways of what was called the craft. The Masons in the 1700s understood the power of symbols to communicate deep psychological ideas, complex political ideas. They're almost zen-like in how simple they appear and yet how profound they might be. Some of them, even the scholars and experts, haven't decoded. The most well-known Freemason symbol is the sign of the linked compass and square. These simple tools of the medieval stonemasons remind the Freemason to deal honestly, on the square, and to live a measured and moral life. Freemason Akram Elias sees the compass and square as part of the capital's Masonic design. The coded symbols built into the city began with Washington, he believes but their development has continued through the centuries. The top of the compass is the capital. One axis of the compass goes to the White House. The other one is from the capital to the Jefferson Memorial. And then the square is from the Lincoln Memorial to the White House, Lincoln to Jefferson. For this square and compass to be completed, the Jefferson Memorial needed to be where it is today. And you know, that part of the river was landfilled for about six years, from 1933 to 39, under Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Oops, happened to be a mason, by the way, but I don't know. It's probably coincidence, of course it's coincidence. Not even all masons agree. Now, Akram and I do not see eye to eye, and he's gonna give you this lengthy explanation of how Washington was moved by his Masonic ideals to incorporate the 10-mile square as a symbol of the perfection of the city, the perfection of uh, the, the, the United States government, uh, all based upon Masonic ideals. If you take any rectangular grid pattern, you superimpose on it a radial design, you cannot avoid creating something that will look like a square encompasses. And so, no, I don't see him there at all. It's like an Etch-a-Sketch. You start to trace things. If you go really far out, you're going to see any conceivable Masonic symbol is there somewhere. I can look at the streets of Washington and also find a piggy and a horsey. Uh, I don't think they're there. Lower the stone! Imbued with a Freemason code or not, the nation celebrated the founding of its new capital with great patriotic fervor, and Freemasons played the central role in 1793, the Freemasons were asked to lay the cornerstone of the United States Capitol. Washington himself, dressed in his full Masonic regalia, performs a Masonic ritual, which includes libations of corn, wine, and oil. Now, maize is a symbol of abundance, of prosperity. Oil is a symbol of peace. And wine is a symbol of happiness. Thomas Jefferson talks about the Capitol as being a, a temple, the first temple dedicated to the sovereignty of the people. They're acting in some ways as sort of priests of this new nation. They are taking on a sacred function. The president's public embrace of Freemasonry set the fraternity on an uninterrupted course toward power and influence. But that power would suddenly collapse in 1826 with a charge of murder. With George Washington as president and Freemason, the secret society grew more public, gaining membership, power, and influence throughout the young United States. Freemasonry became very popular, and as a result of that, 
Some people started questioning, said, what is happening here? It seems like everywhere you turn, you find a mason. Are these guys taking over the country? Are they, do they have their own secret plot or something? The Freemasons were soon the center of America's first conspiracy theory. It began in France, where the French Revolution turned into Robespierre's reign of terror. Thousands were sent to the guillotine in the name of liberty. In 1798, in America, a shocking book appeared that claimed the French Revolution and the terror that followed were really the work of a small devil-worshipping society that hid under the cover of the Society of Freemasons, the Illuminati. The Illuminati, fascinating, powerful, connotative reference. Cultish, secret, symbolic rituals. The Illuminati was a real historical movement created, interestingly, in the year 1776 in Bavaria. And they did attempt to foment revolutions, and they did spread in secret to some other European countries. A number of people begin to raise fears that the Illuminati have come to America, that they're also trying to create that same sort of thing. George Washington was both president and the country's most famous Freemason. If the country believed the Freemasons were corrupt, the government might collapse. George Washington receives letters from important people in American society asking him to declare that he is not a Freemason. And George Washington replies, sort of, I'm not now and never have been a member of the Illuminati. And he doesn't denounce Freemasonry. The Freemason Illuminati conspiracy theory was based on bad facts. The historical record shows that the Illuminati existed as a group for less than 10 years. The Illuminati were abolished in 1785 with public trials and banishments. But the Freemasons would never completely escape from the shadow of the Illuminati. Against a growing tide of suspicion, by the 1820s, Freemasons were in power all over the country, in small towns, in state houses, and with the election of Freemason James Monroe in the White House as well. But the Masons' position of power and influence was about to end with a crime and a cover-up. Initiation rituals are at the core of Freemasonry. These strange ceremonies draw on traditions thousands of years old. Every Freemason experiences them and swears an oath, promising death to anyone who reveals their secrets. In 1826, William Morgan violated that oath. An ex-Freemason in the western New York state town of Batavia, Morgan announced plans to publish a book exposing every detail of even the highest, most secret Freemason rituals. Soon after, the heavy drinking Morgan was jailed on the trivial charge of defaulting on a $2.60 debt. For many Masons, these were the culmination, the most sacred moments within fraternal activity. The Masons in the area around him, they do all sorts of things to try to stop him from trying to speak to him try to burn down the printing press. And eventually they turn to kidnapping. They take him out of the prison and they ride with him off into the night. Morgan's never seen again. As the carriage pulled away, a witness heard Morgan cry out, murder, murder. Many people think he was killed, which is my view. Some people say he was sent to Canada, sent elsewhere. Four men all local Masons were arrested and charged with kidnapping. As the wheels of justice turn, they don't turn very well because Masons seem to be trying to cover this up. You have, you have Masonic sheriffs packing juries. You have Masonic organizations seeming to try to remove witnesses from the area. When the defendants were let off with light sentences, a public outcry erupted. Even DeWitt Clinton, the powerful governor of New York State and Freemason, was suspected of conspiracy. Public opinion uh, convicted the Masons, all the Masons, not just a group of renegade out of control local Masons, but every Mason everywhere was guilty of the murder. Americans come to see Masonry in a new way. What had seemed to be 
the embodiment of everything that was right about America now seems to be the embodiment of everything that's wrong about America. Freemasonry seems to be an emblem of the compromises, of the failures of this world, a world which claimed to be equal, but yet was deeply stratified, deeply divided. So Masons claimed to be about equality, but yet had kings, had high priests, had worshipful masters in their lodges. By the time of the presidential campaign of 1831, a burgeoning anti-Mason movement had coalesced into a powerful political force. The first third national party, quote unquote, in the United States was the anti-Masonic party. I mean, you could look how well, how narrowly defined <laughs> it was, you know. It was not like a, a libertarian party, you know, or a green party. It was like an anti-Masonic party. You create a party, a national party against something. The anti-Masons lost their presidential bid in 1832 to Andrew Jackson, a Democrat and a Freemason, but the damage had been done. Small-town preachers poured down condemnation on the Masons in their congregations, labeling them blasphemers, atheists, and expelled those who refused to quit the fraternity. New England school teachers shut their classroom doors to the children of Freemasons. A group of wives and mothers even issued dark warnings about unnatural acts committed inside the all-male Masonic lodges. In some places, it just devastates Freemasonry. The Vermont Grand Lodge simply closes up. They decide they can't continue to meet. The Michigan Grand Lodge has the same experience. In New York, in New England, Freemasonry was virtually destroyed. Uh, in Maryland, where my membership is, I believe we lost half our lodges. The Freemasons might have disappeared from America in the wake of what was known as the Morgan Affair. But the Freemasons would rise again, propelled by a mysterious, charismatic leader who would transform the fraternity and lead to charges that the Freemasons were secretly in league with the devil. The Freemasons' rise in America took a staggering blow with the kidnapping and disappearance of William Morgan in the 1820s. Over the next 20 years, the Freemasons reinvented themselves as a large but low-profile charitable organization. Masons no longer boast about how powerful they are. They no longer talk about how God created their fraternity. So masonry comes back, and by the 1860s, it is beginning to grow again in dramatic scale. No one was more responsible for the Freemasons' growth in the 19th century than the controversial figure of Albert Pike. His work would transform the Freemasons and provide the fuel for every Freemason conspiracy theory to come. Pike made a tremendous contribution to Freemasonry, but also Albert Pike as a person is one of the most controversial, you know, Freemasons. Pike's work would bring charges of racism, Satanism, and charges that a hidden cabal of leaders inside the society secretly directed a Freemason conspiracy to rule America. He was 300 pounds, he was over six feet tall, and he looked for all the world like Merlin the Magician. He was a Renaissance man in his knowledge and interests. Uh, one of the main things that he accomplished was rewriting the rituals, the rituals, uh, those allegorical stories that teach the ethical and moral lessons. He wrote this incredible volume, Morals and Dogma, and he just went to town with all of the lure of uh, ancient uh, religion, philosophy, and um, uh, esoteric things of all kinds. He might mention Druids or Gnostics or whatever, as well as very Christian themes, very classical themes. Pike combined ancient religions, astrology, myths, and legends to create an elaborate new set of 33 Masonic initiations. The conspiracy theories claim that these 33 strange ceremonies and degrees hold the key to understanding the truth about the Freemasons. It's a philosophical system which teaches moral instruction. We have the Lodge of Perfection, which is the first 14 degrees, the Chapter of Rose Croix, the Council of Kadosh, and a Consistory of Masters of the Royal Secret. 
conspiracy theorists charge that these higher degrees are taught the true nature of the Freemason conspiracy, and that this truth is hidden from ordinary Masons. They point to Pike's own words, which seem to teach the art of deception. The first three degrees are but the outer court of the temple. Part of the symbols are displayed there to the initiate, but he is intentionally misled by false interpretations. Their true explication is reserved for the adepts, the princes of masonry. The notion that the higher degrees conceal information from the lower degrees is actually taken out of context. The statement occurs in Morals and Dogma uh, in the chapter on the Knight's Kadosh, which is the ritual that reenacts the Knight Templar legend the Knights Templar, were the medieval monks that fought in the Crusades that were destroyed by Pope Clement V and King Philip the Fair of France. Now, Pike taught that that degree should warn us about the abuses of power. He saw Pope Clement V and Philip the Fair as potential dangers to mankind and believed the early Masons veiled the meaning in allegories in the lower degrees to keep their ceremonies secret. Pike, who had been a Confederate Brigadier General in the Civil War, is also the source of another Freemason mystery, the question of his supposed relationship with the Ku Klux Klan. I've read that he supposedly wrote the rituals of the KKK. This is simply not true. I've looked through our entire collection of manuscripts of original writings by Pike, his personal correspondence from the period of the Civil War on up to the time that he died. There's not a single reference to the KKK. There's no evidence that Pike was ever a member, much less that he wrote the rituals. In an 1868 newspaper editorial, Pike did write that nothing much would come of the Klan, as it was poorly organized. He argued instead for a different secret society. We would unite every white man in the South, he wrote, who is opposed to Negro suffrage into one great order of Southern Brotherhood whose very existence should be concealed from all but its members. It's a bit like Thomas Jefferson. You know, it's, there are sometimes contradictions that you cannot reconcile. I mean, he's a great founding father, you know, main drafter of the Declaration of Independence, yes. Yet his, his attitude towards slavery, you know, and what he did privately, I mean, how can you have these two people be the same? What well, they are. They are, and I guess we're human beings. Pike's Freemason elite is the 33rd degree, called the Inspector's General. To this day, this invitation-only group governs the Freemasons in Pike's southern jurisdiction. 33rd degree Masons have included President Harry Truman, General Douglas MacArthur, and the once powerful and feared FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover. Every one of them charged the conspiracy theories manipulated events to help maintain control of America. The lack of evidence only seems to encourage the true believers. They accuse Freemasons of doing wicked, terrible things, um, and when you tell them that it just doesn't happen, they, they just simply say, well, you don't know yet, you're not high enough. Well, I know plenty of extremely senior uh, Freemasons, Grand Masters of running countries, and I know exactly what they know, because they ask me for advice on certain things. Um, and there is no high level, um, it just doesn't exist. The ultimate charge against the Freemasons is that they worship the devil. The accusation seems to stem from a single paragraph in Pike's 861 page book, Morals and Dogma. Lucifer, the son of the morning, is it he who bears the light, and with its splendors intolerable, blinds, feeble, sensual, or selfish souls? Doubt it not. The morning star is the planet Venus. In Latin, it's called Lucifer, which means literally light bearer, because it rises just before the sun comes. And so it, it, it is the bringer of the light. And what he meant is that it heralds the dawn and brings light to mankind. And unfortunately, in other contexts, Lucifer is Satan, and away you go with that. And so he appeared to be praising and lauding Satan, which was never his meaning, and it would be very wrong to take it that way. The Lucifer myth was exploited by a French author, pen name Leo Taxel, who wrote a wildly popular series of pamphlets and books denouncing masonry in the 1890s. 
but in 1897, Taxol proudly revealed that his depiction of Albert Pike as a Satanist was a complete and utter hoax. But for the Freemasons, the genie was out of the bottle. If you see the word Lucifer in Pike's book, and Taxel has told you that he's the sovereign pontiff of Lucifer, well, it all comes together. Those, those poor Masons, they're misled by the evil inner circle. And to the present, people have breathlessly told their friends, do you realize what the Masons are doing? And I suspect these are the same people that, that send an email and say, did you hear about the poor woman who dried her poodle in a microwave? Modern day zealots even see signs of Taxel's devil in the layout of the streets of Washington, D.C. In the layout of Washington, you will find an image of an inverted five-pointed star. You're going to see two of the points sticking up. And away you go, you've got now a satanic image. And they believe that it was written into the design of Washington. <laughs> Very few rational people may truly believe the devil's face is embedded in the streets of Washington. But no Freemason mystery is more widespread than the rumors that swirl around the great seal of the United States and the strange symbols that appear on the $1 bill. By the 20th century, the Freemasons were deeply ingrained in American life. Their House of the Temple, completed in 1915, stands exactly 13 blocks from the White House. High above the 33 entrance steps, one for each Freemason degree, stands an unfinished 13-step pyramid, exactly the same design that appears on the back of the United States $1 bill. For generations, Americans have wondered about the possibility of a secret Freemason code hidden on the dollar bill. People will tell you that it was put there by the Freemasons, that there are secret words and anagrams, that if you draw a hexagram around the Great Seal, the letters that it connects are M-A-S-O-N, that 1776 is the year that the Illuminati of Bavaria was formed, that our all-seeing eye and unfinished pyramid are all there as our way of telling the world that we are in charge. Hogwash. The symbols on the dollar bill are derived from the Great Seal of the United States. The familiar American bald eagle appears on the front. The reverse features the mysterious pyramid and an all-seeing eye. The true story of the Great Seal begins with a committee formed the same day the Declaration of Independence was signed, July 4, 1776. It was designed by four separate committees over six years. Only one Freemason served on any of the committees, and that was Benjamin Franklin. Franklin served on the first committee, and he proposed as a design Moses standing on the banks of the Red Sea, parting the waters, while in the foreground were the children of Israel, and in the background were Pharaoh and his hosts. The final design was approved by Congress in 1782. George Washington, Ben Franklin, and other founding fathers were all Freemasons. Every symbol on the Great Seal would share both their Freemason heritage and their dreams for the new nation. Beginning with the incomplete pyramid, a symbol for both the Freemasons and their founding fathers. The pyramid is not unique to masonry, but masons give it a great significance. You see, masons are builders. So we're talking here about the American experiment. It's a building process. The fact that it's uncompleted, and this is the explanation that's given by the, the State Department and the SEAL, means that we have not completed and perfected our nation yet. We're still working on it, and we certainly are. The pyramid is a familiar symbol. The eye emanating light is not. Possibly derived from the Egyptian god's eye, by the Renaissance, the eye had become a common symbol for the all-seeing eye of the Christian god watching over all of creation. The Freemasons would adopt the all-seeing eye, but not until 14 years after it first appeared on the Great Seal. For the Founding Fathers, the all-seeing eye was a way of acknowledging God without any reference to a specific church. They have an all-seeing eye to suggest the notion that somehow, without a specific Christian God concept, 
someone, some being, some presence is overlooking the world. In masonry, the concept is very simple. To defeat ignorance, to defeat tyranny, to defeat fanaticism, the three eternal enemies of the free mind, of the Freemason, you need to seek light. You need to become an enlightened citizen. No part of the Great Seal is more controversial than the Latin phrase novus ordo seclorum. The designer, Charles Thompson, a non-Mason, borrowed the words from a 2,000-year-old Latin poem. Translated, the phrase reads, New Order of the Ages, a reference to the dawn of the American era. The words have no direct connection to Freemasonry at all. The idea of a new social order, which is what I think the Novo Order Seclorum means, is the idea that we are building a new society in uh, the early United States. Talking about here building a new experiment, building a new republic, building a new order that is different from the old order, which was represented by an absolutist monarchy in an absolutist church. And one of the ways that I think it's mistranslated is new secular order, with the emphasis being on rooting out uh, religion. So people who look at this and see these conspiracy theories that are missing the point, really, of the history of the American Revolution and its ideals. The Founding Fathers' ideals are embodied in Washington, D.C., the city they built as a tribute to democracy. A new theory, first published by a French author in 1979, claims that the Freemasons among the Founding Fathers also built a secret code into Washington, making the entire city one vast pagan altar, a tribute to a goddess. The theory begins with the so-called Federal Triangle, the Washington Monument, the Capitol Building, and the White House. The significance, says the theory, can be found in the stars above. Every year between August 10th and 15th, just after sunset, three bright stars align directly over the Federal Triangle. You'll be looking at these three stars, Arcturus, Regulus, and Spica. Arcturus appears above the Washington Monument, Regulus above the White House, and Spica above the Capitol. In the triangle, hovering over the city's most important buildings, shines the constellation Virgo, the Virgin Goddess. This strange annual alignment might be a coincidence, or it might have been deliberately created by Freemasons like George Washington, practicing a strange and ancient religion. And from this comes this theory that the entire city of Washington was oriented toward the Virgo symbol in the sky, which would be the Virgin, which if you trace it back can be Christian in nature, which would be the Virgin Mary. But if you trace it back far enough, you get right back to the Greek goddess Minerva or Isis, the Egyptian goddess. The idea of orienting your city to a goddess would be to seek to get the divine benevolence from that goddess. It seems an absurd theory on the surface, but there is this enigmatic portrait of the first Freemason, President George Washington. Washington's son holds the central Freemason symbol of the compass. Washington, his wife, and his daughter clearly indicate three specific points on a map of Washington, D.C. A triangle, location unknown. Freemason leader Albert Pike did call for a painting of constellations featuring Virgo to be placed on the ceiling of every Freemason lodge. And 19th century Masons did often reproduce images of Virgo tended by a master Mason sometimes under her zodiac sign. In fact, the zodiac sign of Virgo appears repeatedly in Washington. The district has a total of 53 zodiacs, more than any other capital city in the world, including this image of Virgo rising on the statue of James Garfield, president and Freemason. 
As with so many Freemason mysteries, the truth about Virgo may never be known with 100% certainty. And while the Freemasons have embodied the cherished American values of independence, equality, and brotherhood since the first days of the Revolution, their long history of keeping secrets means that the Freemasons will never be entirely above suspicion. Having studied Freemasonry for so long, it's, it seems very strange to me that people still see Masonry as being something which has this extraordinarily wide-ranging impact on society and in a very bad kind of way. As a non-Mason, as a scholar, I would have liked nothing more than to find some major Masonic conspiracy. And unfortunately for Mike Fame, the idea that there's a secret Masonic conspiracy just doesn't seem to hold up. The debate about who the Freemasons really are and what their impact has been on society here in America will most certainly continue. The myths, the rituals, and the secrecy that surround the Freemasons all act to keep the mysteries unsolved and the conspiracy theories alive.